This teaching is going to be from Revelation chapter 12 and starting in verse 1 concerning the woman and the man child. Now, I consider it to be a very important teaching for the end time, and so we'll get right into it. And Revelation chapter 12, and starting in verse 1, what we're seeing is visions that the Lord was giving to John. And of course, John's writing them down, and it would be for us as God's people to be able to interpret the symbols that are there so we can understand what the Lord's trying to show us for the end time. And in part of this study, I will be taking some time to show that this is something that happens at the end time and not something that happened in the past. So that's going to be important also because there's plenty of teaching out there today that's trying to weaken any thought that the book of Revelation is actually in the future, that some of us may actually live to see those times. So starting in Revelation 12, verse 1, it says that, and remember, this is what John is seeing in vision. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And it says that she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. So he sees a, a glorious woman in this vision. Now, uh, I think that as a new covenant people, the first thing that will pop into our minds as to who this woman is would be the church. But not that way for a lot of people. You know, some people say that this is uh, Mary. Some people say that it's Israel. But let's see what the Bible has to say about it, the Apostle Paul, because if we can understand who this woman is, then we can, I believe, interpret the vision. In Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll be reading 25 through 32 there, the Apostle Paul mentions a woman. See if we can recognize her. He says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So I think you can see where this is going. He says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. Why? For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So the Apostle Paul lets us know here that there is a woman in the life of Jesus, and that that woman is his church, that he loves his church, he cares for his church. And, uh, that church is part of his own flesh and of his own bones. And so the mystery that Paul is speaking about here is concerning Christ and the church. So to think that the woman in Revelation chapter 12 in this vision may be the church, uh, I think is a very strong possibility. Uh, is there anything else that Paul had to say about that? Well, how about 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2? Here the Apostle Paul speaks along that same line like this. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin 
to Christ. So when Paul thought of uh, the church, he thought of the church as a woman, various places in his writings. So for the Holy Spirit to show John the church as a woman, I don't think would be any uh, uh, outrageous thing that we would expect to happen. But it would be what I think we would expect to happen because we're shown here that the church is the bride of Christ. When Jesus comes in Revelation 19, I believe it is, it talks about that his uh, bride has made herself ready. So we're starting with the belief that the woman in this vision is the church. And it says that she's clothed with the sun. So let's delve into that for a minute, see if it strengthens our case. The woman is clothed with the sun. So if it's the church, we are going to show here now that the church is clothed with the sun. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay, so if we have put on Christ, isn't that the same as being clothed with Christ? We have put on Christ when we were baptized into his name. And Paul says, in doing so, we have put him on. So that sounds a lot like being clothed with the Son, if you, of course, believe that Jesus is the Son, which we do, I do, of, of course. And uh, I think that that's a strong evidence that who we're talking about here is the church. She's clothed with the sun. Now it goes on to say, There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now this verse 29 is really important. We're going to be coming back to it later. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. But what we're focusing on right now is that the woman was clothed with the sun. Paul tells us that we're the children of God by faith in Christ because as many of us as were baptized into Christ, baptized into his name, have put him on. Well, if we've put him on, again, isn't that the same as if uh, we're wearing him or we're clothed? with him which is the sun? Now someone might say, well, uh, in the vision it's S-U-N. And what I'm talking about here in Galatians is S-O-N. Well, we'll look into that for just a minute in uh, Malachi chapter 4 and see if you agree with me on this. The prophet Malachi chapter 4 verse 2, and he's writing some things concerning the end times. And he says, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. The Son of Righteousness will arise. Well, who do you think that is? Uh, would you say that that's somebody besides Jesus? Or do you think that that is Jesus? Well, it would seem pretty clear that it is Jesus, friends. Jesus is the Son of Righteousness that's going to arise in the end of days. And so for us to see in the vision that the woman is clothed with the sun and it's S-U-N, again, that shouldn't be hard to understand that that's talking about Jesus. So the woman is clothed with Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. But now it says that the moon is under this woman's feet. So let me read to you in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So the woman is... a. Uh, sitting in heavenly places with Christ, being the church, and uh, 
as it says that the moon is under her feet. Now, if we're so far seeing that the woman is the church, now Paul says that the church is seated in heavenly places in Christ. Well, now that's true spiritually. In the spirit, that's true, isn't it? It's written right here for us. Paul wants us to believe that, that the believer, if that he's abiding in Jesus, he's abiding in heavenly places. Now, in the heavenly places, Jesus, it says that, uh, I think it's in uh, Ephesians also, tells us that he was raised and seated far above all principalities and powers, far above all things. So if the church is seating or is sitting uh, with Jesus in heavenly places, spiritually, of course, then the church right now is above the moon. Jesus is above all things. The church is seated with Jesus. So if uh, the moon is under the feet of this woman, then that's another sign to us that it is talking about the woman. Uh, she's high and lifted up. She's raised up and glorified in the spirit. You know, there's still, of course, a greater glorification to come. But in the spirit, she's seated with Jesus in heavenly places. Her affections are on things above and not on the earth. So it also tells us in Revelation 12 that this woman has a crown of 12 stars on her head. So what might that be talking about? Well, I present to you that it's talking about the apostles' doctrine. The apostles' doctrine is in her mind, is close to her mind, and she's crowned with it. She's living with it. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we read, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. So the church, the woman, is abiding in and continuing in the apostles' doctrine. It's the apostles' doctrine that uh, informs our mind, trains our mind on what we should believe, on what we should do, how we should act. And so the church uh, has the apostles' doctrine as a crown upon her head uh, to follow in the ways of Jesus because the apostles' doctrine is simply the doctrine of Christ. Now let's see what Jesus said about the apostles' doctrine in John chapter 17. Now here he, in his humanity, is crying out to God and asking for certain things to happen. And one of the things that he prays about is in John 17, verse 20. And Jesus said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Shall believe on me through their word. So anybody that's believing in the real Jesus Christ, since he was crucified, they're believing in him through the apostles' word. That's the apostles' doctrine. You see how important that is? How important that the words of the apostles are to the people of God? As I said, see, if we're believing in a Jesus and it's not coming from the apostles' doctrine, then we're not believing in the right Jesus. Jesus said that he's praying for those, which is the apostles, and he puts it like this, uh, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also. Now that would be us. That would be the church, wouldn't it? For them also which shall believe on me through their word. Friends, we have to take on the mind of Christ. Paul said that we have the mind of Christ in 1 Corinthians. So the apostles Doctrine, I believe, is that crown of that has 12 stars on it that is on the head of the woman. Her intellect is what's teaching her. It is what is uh, instructing her in her ways. So, at this point, uh, I think that we are uh, pretty well set in the idea that this woman is actually the church. 
Now it said there that uh, she being with child cried, travailed in birth, and pained to be delivered. Now what's happening with the woman, of course, now that's the church. Uh, this is an end time event. And Jesus Christ is doing uh, great and awesome things at the end of time because he actually has a purpose. He has a purpose for that woman. He wants to marry her. He wants to uh, spend eternity with her. And so there's things happening inside of the church that's preparing her for that marriage, preparing her for that day when she's actually going to be one with Jesus Christ. We are one with him now, yes, we can say in the spirit or spiritually, but there's coming a day that that's going to be magnified even more. And so what's happening in the church, even perhaps in our day, now I should say this, that uh, I think that we could very well be close to the time that's being described here, but maybe not. It maybe isn't uh, this time yet. Could still be many years before it happens. But I do believe the Lord has shown us certain things that's going to happen at that time. And, uh, you know, both for our uh, joy, for our blessing, so we can see the things that God does. And if we are that particular generation, that particular time, then we can know pretty much the things that are going to be happening. And that's going to be very important for us. But uh, it talks about the travail that the woman's going through. Look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19. Paul writes there to the Galatians and says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. So, what is happening is that in this woman, there is a seed. In this woman, there is a child. This woman's getting ready to give birth. And what's happening is, and uh, I believe I'll be able to show by the time we're through here, is that she's going to bring forth uh, children that are going to be like Jesus Christ. They're going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ in his doctrine, and in his ways. And it says there, Paul said about the Galatians, that even though they had been born again, even though they were saved as a people, he said he was travailing in birth again until Christ was formed in them. So that's what's happening in the woman, is that uh, the children, the seed is being formed. They're being formed. They're growing into the image of Jesus. And isn't that the uh, end goal for the believer, is that they might be like Jesus? As we're told in Galatians, 5, or rather uh, Matthew 5, verse 48, Jesus said, Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So we, yes, are supposed to be like Jesus in his belief, in his ways. And so that's what's happening in this woman. There's a travail in the church. There's a uh, forming, there's a stretching, there's a growing of people that are going to come forth to the birth. And now we can see in Revelation there that the enemy doesn't like this. And we are told that the, uh, as the woman is uh, in pain and she's travailing in birth, that the problem is that there's an enemy. There's an enemy of the woman. And of course, that enemy is the devil. We can see that in many places in the Bible. But the enemy is called uh, the dragon in various places. And we want to show you now that this is talking not about things that happened in the past. And I hope that some of you have stayed with me long enough to go through this. Because there are those who teach that uh, these are things that happened in the past. And we'll show that that isn't the case. Now the dragon that is 
against the woman and the dragon that is wanting to devour the child that the woman is bringing forth, the dragon appears with the woman. Now, what is the time frame? Because that's very important for us. If we can set the time frame, that will settle some other questions for us. Is it something in the past or something in the future? Well, it says in verse 3, There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. So this is what is trying to destroy the church. This is what's trying to devour the child that the woman is travailing to bring forth to the birth. And we're going to see, I think, that uh, in a little bit here, that that child represents the overcomers in the church, those who are actually like Jesus at this time. So why do I think that this is happening at the time of the end and not at some time in the past? Well, when you see that this dragon appears, it describes the dragon as having seven heads and ten horns. So, if we would look at Revelation chapter 13, which is the next chapter over, we see another vision like this. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns. Now, that's the very same thing that appears along with the woman. That's the very same thing now that's fighting against the woman. So they're both existing at the same time frame. See that? The woman and this dragon are existing at the same time frame. Is it at the beginning or is it at the end? Is it in the past or is it in the future? Verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Might make a comment here. Not too many people are thinking in terms of that someday on this planet that people are going to be worshipping Satan. People don't really think in that light, do they? In our time, uh, we look around and we see that there are people that worship other gods besides Jesus, but not many of them are actually worshiping, I mean, uh, they're not uh, intentionally worshiping the dragon. But it looks here like the people are worshiping the dragon. And so we're coming into a time where the devil is going to be worshiped here on this earth. The devil is going to be worshiped and he's going to uh, have this happen through this beast that we're talking about. And this is why I'm saying that these things happen at the end. They happen in the future. Could say the end of this age, but definitely in the future as opposed to in the past. Because we haven't yet seen the time when the world is worshiping the dragon outright. And it says, All the world wondered after the beast, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So we hear talk about, you know, like the mark of the beast a lot in our day. Even people that are not Christians, they talk about it because the things they've heard about it, and they believe it to come in the future, which I think is the right way to look at it. But... This, I think, is showing us that these things are happening at the time of this end-time beast. You know, the time of the mark of the beast. Not a time that was before that, but at this particular time. The woman, which is the church, 
appears with at the same time with this dragon and the dragon is appearing at this time with his beast it says that the whole world wondered after the beast he's given amazing power paul tells us in second thessalonians chapter 2 that he comes with lying signs and wonders tells us in revelation various places that he deceives the whole world but let's read on a little bit it says, uh, who is able to make war with him? So even though the beast may come in as a man of peace, which a lot of people teach, it's not going to stay that way. He's going to be a very vicious, a very violent man. And it says that the people of the earth are going to be saying, well, who can make war with him? Who could stand against the beast? And there was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So there is a certain time which the beast will rule with an iron fist over the uh, domain that he's given to rule over. And uh, I think that this really is helpful to us. We're told forty-two months. Now it's going to take time when the beast actually is starting to make his appearance on the scene on the earth. It's going to take time for him to gain his reputation. So we don't know how long that this person may be making waves in the end time before this last 42 months. But for 42 months, then he's given power over the saints. He's given power over the church in the sense of persecuting them, in the sense of putting them to death. Now, he's not going to have power over their soul because nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. But he is going to be given power over the church, whoever it is that's living at that time. If it's us, uh, we will be persecuted and many of us will be put to death by this beast. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. All of the heavenly host. There's going to be war between uh, this dragon and his angels and Michael and his angels. So the heavenly hosts are going to collide in that day like never before. Uh, you know, would of course remind us that sure, there's spiritual warfare going on right now, but all of these things are going to be intensified in the last days. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. So do we have an ear today? We're trying to show that these are events of the end time. They're not events that have already taken place. Because when this happens, uh, at the time this happens, the beast is going to be front and center. Now, that's not the way it is right now. You know, we have not seen this, uh, this uh, beast whose deadly wound was healed. And the whole world is worshiping him and saying, who's like the beast? Who can make war with him? And it's been given to him to uh, persecute and kill the saints for 42 months. We haven't seen that yet. Yes, there has, of course, been persecution in times past, uh, even what we would call dreadful persecution. But nothing like this, nothing like we're seeing here in Revelation, this uh, one person with so much power. And it shows us that when he is in the vision with the woman, that it must be something happening to the woman at the time that the beast is around on the earth. So it's talking about end time events, not something that uh, has already happened long ago. So now, uh, since I believe that we've established that, let's go back to the vision. Uh, Revelation 12, verse 4. And his tail 
drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Of course, it's talking about the dragon. The dragon stood before the woman, uh, trying to devour her child as soon as it was born. See, this child is something very special in the plan of God. That's why the devil's standing there, and uh, he's at that point, he's kind of ignoring the woman. He's just waiting for the child to be born so he can destroy it. And we'll find out why as this study goes on. But for now, it says his tail, that is the tail of the dragon, drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Now, a lot of people say that, well, you know, this is talking about the devil way back in times past, you know, maybe before there even was an earth, how that uh, he deceived a third of the angels and took them with him. Well, I true that I believe it is true that uh, the devil has angels, but I don't think this is what that's talking about, and I'll show you why. He took the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. So, who are? Uh, well, first let's establish who is this tail or what is this tail. It says his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So uh, I don't think that there was uh, a man-child back in the days, like when they're trying to say, these people that teach this, when they're trying to say that the devil took a third of the angels with him, uh, probably before uh, the world ever was, is the way that they teach it. And I used to believe that myself before I came to more truth. But we want to find out uh, who the, or what the tale is. And that is in Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15. The ancient and the honorable, he is the head and the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. And the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. Well, at this time, there is going to be a prophet that teaches lies. The false prophet of Revelation, I believe, starting in chapter 13. And this false prophet is going to do great signs and wonders and uh, turn people to worship the beast. And it says that the tail of the dragon swept away a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. So if the tail of the dragon is the prophet that teaches lies, we can again identify that there is a prophet at that time that teaches lies and he's with the beast. And he is uh, of great power. He looks like a lamb but speaks like a dragon. And we could even say, you know, in general, of course, that false prophets teaching lies causes people to fall. You know, and so I believe that's in the mix also as we approach that time. Uh, false prophets coming forth and teaching uh, error, heresies, can make people fall even now. But we're talking here specifically about a certain point in time. Now, uh, if this isn't talking about the, the devil taking a third of the angels with him at some time way back in the past, who's it talking about? Who are the stars of heaven? Well, in Genesis chapter 22, Genesis 22, verses 15 through 18. And Abraham has been tested by God. He was going to uh, sacrifice his son Isaac to the Lord. But of course, the angel of the Lord stopped him. Now the angel of the Lord is the Lord. And it says there that in verse 15, the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. See, the angel of the Lord was still in heaven when he called to Abraham. That was, you know, God himself, his visible form. It wasn't just God sending an angel there to the scene where Abraham was. No, this angel of the Lord, which was the Lord, was still in heaven right then. But he called unto Abraham and said, 
By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and has not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven. I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven. Now, friends, again, we're interpreting the symbolism that's in Revelation chapter 12. It says the dragon swept away a third of the stars of the heaven. Well, it's not talking about the stars that are out there twinkling at night. No, but uh, we can see here that God told Abraham that he would make his children to be as the stars of heaven. And he said, and in thy, uh, verse 18, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So all of the blessing that we get from Jesus Christ, that's because one man obeyed God. See how important obedience to God is? Obedience to God is far more important than what people are making out today. You hear all the time nowadays, people, they'll, you know, they'll preach a message of holiness for 45 minutes or an hour, and when they get done, they'll end it by saying, well, now, I don't mean you have to be perfect. Isn't that ridiculous? You spend an hour preaching on holiness and then turn around and the thing that you sum up with is that I'm not saying you have to be perfect. Well, obviously that's against the will of God because one man obeyed God. Because one man obeyed God, we have all the blessing that we have now. And so uh, God had told Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. But, you know, that's another subject, so we'll continue uh, focused upon the end-time man-child teaching. And uh, it is said that, again, the stars of heaven were drawn away by the tail of the dragon. They were drawn away by what? False doctrine. Because the tail is the prophet that teaches lies. So in the last days, God's people are, as we've already shown in Ephesians chapter 2, were seated in heavenly places in Christ. Our affections are on things above and not on things below. But when the dragon's tail comes forth and draws people, the lies that come from the false prophets, you know, they teach that it's not sufficient to be abiding in Jesus Christ in the Spirit. They teach that it's not enough to uh, be close to Jesus, to be gathered to Him, uh, seated with Him in heavenly places by abiding in Him. They teach things like, well, you know, there's a lot of good things in this world you can experience. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of pleasure that you can take in this world, in this life. And see, there, the dragon's tail, which is the lies of the prophets, they begin to work in men's hearts, women's hearts that are uh, abiding in Jesus and they're loving Jesus and their affections are on things above. And what happens? They begin gradually to lose out with God. They begin to lose their faith and hope in the God that is invisible, in the God that is blessing them right now but is asking them to be patient to see Him until He comes. And so with some of them, the devil or the dragon's tail does its work. And their minds go from being heavenly, their minds going be from uh, set on things above, back to things on the earth. So that's how they fall from the heaven to the earth. They fall from being spiritually minded to being earthly or carnally minded. So that's what the devil is going to do. His false prophet false prophets, they're going to teach lies that will cause some of the saints of God to fall. Now, uh, as far as the stars of heaven being the children of God, rather than being, you know, a third of the angels back in olden times, I said we were going to come back to Galatians 3, so let's go back there now. Because in Genesis 22, God says he's going to make 
Abraham's seed as the stars of heaven. And as we said, this has to be interpreted spiritually because it's a vision that we're looking at. So in Galatians 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now he's talking about the church, right? Verse 29, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. Then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, my friends, the uh, stars of heaven spoken of there in Revelation, that's talking about all of the church. Now, they may be Jew or they may be Gentile, either one, but it's talking about uh, all of God's people. Those that uh, have put on Jesus Christ in baptism, those that are abiding in him, see, they are as the stars of heaven to our God. They are as the stars of heaven to our God. And so in this last time, the last time when it does come, the devil is going to be uh, working to cause them to fall and does cause a third of them to fall from their heavenly places, their wonderful, uh, beautiful place where they're dwelling with Jesus Christ by faith right now. But the enemy brings in the doctrines of carnal men, teaching them that the world is better, that there's more pleasure in the things of the world than there is in the things of God. And then pretty soon, uh, down they go falling back to the earth, seeking after the things below, and no longer seeking after the things which are above. But Paul lets us know that all of the believers, all of those who are Christ, are Abraham's seed. So Abraham's seed was said to be as the stars of heaven. And so that's what we see there in Revelation chapter 12. A third of the saints, a third of the stars of heaven, are deceived in the last days by the tail of the dragon. You know, uh, it's not true that the devil took a third of the angels at uh, some time in the, in the past. The devil did fall. We'll talk about that sometime, Lord willing. But it isn't written that he took a third of the, uh, of the angels with him. But it is written here that the devil's tail, uh, the dragon's tail, does draw entices away a third of these stars of heaven at the last times. So friends, we've said all of this to get to the point where we are now, because the birth of the man-child in the end time is going to be something so glorious and something so great for the people of God. Who is this man-child anyway? Verse 5, She the woman, the church, that has been travailing, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So the woman brings forth the man-child, she gives birth to the man-child, and it says, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron? Well, if we can find out who is going to rule all nations with a rod of iron, then we can know who the man-child is for sure. A lot of people, you know, they teach things like, well, Mary gave birth to Jesus, and that's what this is talking about. Uh, far from it, friends. Yeah, Mary did give birth to Jesus, blessed be her name. You know, but uh, this is talking about the last days of the age. And... It says that they are to rule all nations with a rod of iron. So now we know that Jesus, it is said that he would rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's for sure. That uh, the day is coming when he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. But we can't just leave it there, I don't think, because now Jesus is the one speaking here in Revelation chapter uh, 12, or we're going to actually Revelation uh, chapter 2 to
to find the answer here in verse 26, and Jesus is the one talking. So we're not saying that Jesus is not going to rule all nations, but uh, we can see that Jesus is speaking here in Revelation 2, verse 26 and 27, to certain people. And he says, And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, now this is Jesus talking, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Yes, Jesus is going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. But he says here to the overcomers among his people that they are going to rule with a rod of iron. They're going to rule over the nations with a rod of iron. He says, As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. So, friends, this is Jesus. And Jesus is saying to overcomers. He's saying, and this is really, really important. He's saying this to overcomers, that they are going to rule over nations with a rod of iron. So this man-child is not the birth of Jesus from Mary uh, way back in the first century. No, this birth is overcomers being born out of the church. The church is our mother. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, I believe, Paul says that the uh, Jerusalem which is above is the mother of us all, speaking of the church. So we uh, are born of God into the church, kind of, you might say, and we live for God, and during that time, we're being formed into the image of Christ. As Paul said, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So uh, we start out as an uh, embryo, as a seed, and we grow and we're formed to be like Jesus Christ. So now, this is what's happening at the end time. And like I said, we may be very close to this, maybe not so close, but this is what's going to happen at that time. The church is going through travail. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, self-denying, self-crucifixion, uh, spiritual warfare that's taking place in the church to bring forth this man-child, to bring forth this corporate overcomer. And when it speaks of the man-child, it makes me think of Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul said like this, that uh, apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they're given for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry till the time that we come to a perfect man. Till the time we come to a perfect man. Well, that kind of sounds like this man-child to me, overcomers, people that come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. So out of the woman, spiritually speaking, is birthed or born a man-child. And notice that it's a man-child, born uh, mature, born as a man. Uh, a little different from babies, but uh, that's the way this is going to work. This man-child is going to be born out of the woman at the end time for a certain purpose. And uh, we're going to see that in the next part of this study. Now, uh, we've done all of this study to bring us to the point where I think we can show that the woman is the church and that the man-child is the overcomers that are in the church that are going to be born out of the church or, you know, uh, like I say, it's spiritually interpreted as the rest of the book of Revelation so the birth is actually a supernatural experience where the overcomers are going to actually uh, be given to know the fullness of Christ. Uh, we're in this as ministers, those of us who are, for a purpose. We're for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry until we come to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the fullness of the stature of Christ. 
So there's going to be a group of overcomers that actually come to the fullness of Christ. And when they do at this time, they're going to be, spiritually speaking, born out from the woman. They're going to be in a sense, uh, and don't get me wrong, because I can almost hear it now, people saying that I'm teaching that, uh, that the overcomers are no longer part of the church. Well, they are, but they're going to be distinct from the church, and it's going to be for a certain reason. And it says that uh, her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So think about that for a minute. The man-child is born. In other words, the overcomers come forth. They appear in the last days. Now the dragon is standing there before the woman, ready to devour the man-child, ready to destroy it as soon as it's born. The devil doesn't want the world to see what Jesus Christ really looks like. He doesn't want to see the image of Jesus Christ coming forth in the church because he knows what is going to happen next if that actually happened. So his purpose is to destroy the man-child, to stop its birth. Now, uh, it happens. It happens, and instead of the dragon getting to destroy it, what happens? It's caught up to the throne of God. Friends, it's caught up to the throne of God. Someone says, well, is that the pre-trib rapture? No, because this is spiritually speaking. Uh, the symbols and the things that happened were uh, interpreting them symbolically. This is not talking about a pre-trib rapture, because as uh, Scripture shows in many other places, there is no such thing. Uh, Jesus Christ in His coming, uh, the literal coming of Christ, is going to be after the Great Tribulation, not before. So this is talking about something that is symbolic. The man-child, uh, which I'm saying is the overcomers, and let me elaborate just a little bit more on that. It says that uh, they shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. So that's a promise given to overcomers. Now, if you have read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 before, I believe it is, uh, it might be chapter 5, can't remember right offhand, but it starts out saying that Paul the Apostle says to the church, Know you not that you shall rule the world? Don't you know that you shall judge angels? So that's what this is talking about. They're going to come forth and they're going to uh, be perfected. They're going to be in the full stature of Christ. But now uh, there's got to be some more work done. Because guess what? Not everybody in the church is an overcomer. And so that's going to be, uh, uh, of course, the, uh, that would be purpose B, is that the man-child is going to be used in the end time to minister to the rest of the woman, to the church that were not overcomers at that time. And we'll get more into that a little bit later, you know, in some next time. But for now... Uh, we're saying that the overcomers are caught up to God and to His throne, and that is symbolically speaking. It's symbolism. And that uh, they are actually going to, in, in reality, in a little while after this, they are actually going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. As Paul said, Know you not you shall judge the earth? Know you not you shall judge angels? So that's going to happen, but that's to me just another identification that the man-child is talking about the church rather than something else. Now, uh, as to the catching up of the man-child being symbolic rather than literal, because we don't want people to get confused, the way that uh, most people teach this that believe in the message of the overcomers, the man-child, they teach that it's talking about a pre- or a mid-trib rapture. But is it possible, you know, because like I said, uh, in other studies we've shown that the rapture, what we call the rapture, the second coming, where Jesus literally takes his people from the earth and into the sky and uh, changes them into immortal bodies, immortal persons, uh, that's pretty easily proven in the Bible. 
But now, what about uh, being caught up to the heavenlies and then coming back down? Is that anywhere in the Bible? Because I'm going to show in my next video that that is the purpose of all of this, is that the man-child, the overcomers, see, they're like forerunners. They're like first fruit overcomers out of the woman. The woman in general is not ready to meet Jesus Christ, but the man-child is. The man-child is in the image of Jesus Christ, that perfect man of Ephesians 4, uh, the body of Christ that is spoken of in the scriptures. Uh, people that actually come to the full stature of Jesus Christ, which is God's will for his whole church. Not everybody makes it, you know, but that's his will for everybody in the church is that they would be overcomers. And I'm saying that this man-child experience here, the catching up of the man-child, is going to be God equipping the man-child, the overcomers, to then do great things in the earth in this last day, or that last day, however it pans out. And I'm going to show you now, uh, have men ever been caught up to heaven before and then came back down to the earth and ministered? Well, how about Revelation 4? How about the Apostle John himself, the one that's seeing the vision? Uh, matter of fact, when he's uh, giving this vision, when he's writing it down probably, guess where he was at? Revelation 4, verse 1 and 2. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. Come up hither. So John's uh, uh, in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and a voice speaks to him, Come up hither, and guess what happens? He says, and uh, the voice says, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So, yes, it's true, friends, that there have been those who have been taken up, caught up into the heavenlies, but then they came back down. Paul, or uh, rather John, in this situation, He's going up so he can see all of these visions, but not to stay in heaven as an immortal being, but rather to come back down to the earth so he can share those things that he saw with the readers. So uh, when we say that the man-child will be caught up to the throne of God, that it's symbolism, and that the man-child can then be right back on the earth, we're not making it up. Uh, let's give another one. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Paul speaking and says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So, not only did this happen to the Apostle John, it happened to the Apostle Paul. Somebody might say that, uh, well, Paul doesn't say it was himself. He says he knew a man. Well, you know, that, uh, that in itself would be irrelevant because my point is just that it's possible for a man to be taken up to the throne of God and then come back down and minister on the earth. It happened to John, and here we see that it happened to Paul. Uh, he heard things when he was there that he said he couldn't utter when he came back to the earth. But what's going to happen in Revelation 12 with a man-child, I believe these are types 
of that. Uh, those who are the overcomers, I would like to be one. It would uh, you know? I would think that many people would like to be one. You know, overcomers that are uh, crucifying self and uh, living a life of abiding in Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. That the time would come, they would experience something like this, like John experienced, like Paul experienced, and friends, both of them came back to minister. And the man-child is going to come back to minister in this last day. And uh, I'm going to show you that in the next video. So I appreciate those of you who have stayed with me. And uh, I believe that you would learn something from this and that it could have some effect on uh, people's lives as the days get closer.